Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho and I am board certified in holistic nutrition. I work with clients to get to root cause healing and oftentimes that is starting with a meat-based elimination diet for gut healing. Today I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Dr. Philip Ovedia is board certified as a cardiac surgeon. If you are looking for a doctor that can read blood work for a low carb diet. Dr. Philip Ovedia offers telemedicine in all 50 states. Dr. Philip Ovedia was obese at one point and he worked on his diet to change his metabolic health for healing. He has lost over a hundred pounds and now is working towards helping patients not get on his operating table. Dr. Philip Ovedia has a new book that is very comprehensive when it comes to working on metabolic health. What is metabolic health? We talk about it a lot. And so in his book, he clarifies what it is, steps to get towards healing your metabolic health. We talk about some of it in this interview, but make sure to check out his book as he goes into a lot more detail. His book, Stay Off My Operating Table, is out now, and so make sure to check it out. All right, let's get right into the discussion. Hi, Dr. Philip Ovedia. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to share your story and your new book. Um, if you can just introduce yourself to the people that are listening and watching. Sure thing, Judy. It's great to be here with you. Uh, I am Dr. Philip Ovedia. I am a heart surgeon. I have been in practice for approximately 15 years now. And through my own personal battle to overcome obesity, which we will get into, I learned the importance of of metabolic health, and I came to realize how important it was not only for obesity, but preventing heart disease and many of the other chronic diseases that we face. And I am now on a mission to help people to stay off my operating table. Thank you. And thank you so much for playing a big part in that. Um, I saw a manuscript of your book and the outline is fantastic. Um, I just wanted to get straight into it and show a few snippets in your book. Uh, one section is um, about myths, myths about nutrition and disease. And you have these 12 myths in your book. And I wanted to touch upon just a few of them. Um, one of them is that you say only obese people are considered metabolically unhealthy. And you say that's untrue. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Sure thing. And one of the important things for people to understand is that these are myths that not only are told to patients, but that doctors themselves oftentimes don't realize aren't mm -hmm. true. So metabolic health and obesity are certainly related, but they are not the same thing. And it is possible, although rare, to be obese and be metabolically healthy. But more importantly, it is common to not be obese and still be metabolically unhealthy. What I try and get people to realize is that you need to measure your metabolic health. And you can't just assume that you are metabolically healthy just because you are not obese. You've probably heard the statistic that 88% of the adults in the United States are not metabolically healthy. Sure. And that's a staggering statistic. But what people don't realize is that approximately 40% of people who are normal weight are metabolically unhealthy as well. So it, you absolutely cannot assume that just because you are not obese, that you are metabolically healthy. Yeah. And I can attest to that in the Asian community. Most of my uncles are very lean, but they are all diabetic. They are all on medication. And my mom is the only one that follows a carnivore diet and she is no longer diabetic or you know, she's, I guess, managing her diabetes through not eating a lot of carbohydrates. And so she's not taking any metformin, but no one would ever think they're metabolically unhealthy because they all look very healthy, but they're not. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, Asian and Indian uh, genetics yes. are such that it's very common. And yeah. you look at the Asian countries and they, you know, increasingly have high rates of diabetes yes. and poor metabolic health despite the fact that they are nowhere near as obese as, you know, we are here in the United States. Yes. Another myth of yours is that the food pyramid is based on science. And you say that is also a myth. 
how did we come up with the food pyramid? You know, that is a great question. And again, you know, many doctors, most patients are going to believe that, oh, you know, this this panel of, you know, the smartest scientists in the land must have gotten together to come up with the right. food pyramid. And the reality is, is that the food pyramid was largely uh, devised by non-physicians, uh, many non-scientists, in fact, and it was based on poor data. Um, you know, Nina Teichholz talks about right. in her book, uh, you know, how during the original congressional hearings that led to the, you know, that created the process that ultimately led to the food pyramid, it was discussed and it was admitted that they did not have good evidence to suggest what people should be eating and not eating. But it was felt at the time that there was such a, you know, threat from the rising obesity and heart right. disease that they didn't have time to wait for good science. So the original food pyramid was not based on good science. And unfortunately, as this process has evolved, it gets updated every five years. And in the most recent update, for instance, you know, the, the topic of low carb, you know, nutrition was brought up and the committee said that there was not enough evidence to, you know, comment on low carb and, you know, Nina and her, you know, her organization presented the committee with over 40 studies on low carbohydrate nutrition and its role in, you know, health. And they just refused to consider those studies. Yeah, I saw a draft version of the updates and they said something like uh, reducing sugars until maybe 6% of your diet. And uh, the final one was higher than that. So it seemed like they were trying to lower the amount of sugar, but they only lowered it by maybe a few. I, I can't remember the exact amount, but it was very small that they sh shifted the added sugar um, to the recommended dietary allowance. And it's just unfortunate. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, what has happened now in, uh, you know, today's world is that many of the the members of the committee that decide on the U.S. dietary guidelines have, you know, relationships with the food industry. Right. Many of them are former executives of the food industry or, you know, the, the people go back and forth. Uh, it, it's a term called regulatory capture. And so it's it's literally, you know, the, the fox guarding the hen house. Right. And it's unfortunate because it affects everything, right? It affects um, our jail system, our schools, our hospitals, what people advocate for as registered dietitians. It affects every single part of our communities as to what we say and define as healthy and what's not. And it's just not ideal in, uh, in most cases. So another one, another myth we, you talk about is that, um, you can't get healthy without exercise. Yeah. So people believe that, you know, exercise is, you know, as important or maybe the most important thing, you know, it, as to whether or not they're going to be healthy. And the reality is, is that, you know, that's just not true. Um, the primary determinant of our health is what we eat. Now, I am not telling people, you know, that exercise is not healthy and exercise is not beneficial, but we should understand that, you know, it is possible and I have, I see it, you know, every day in the people that I work with that you can vastly improve your metabolic health. You can get metabolically healthy without exercising. Sure. It's great if you add exercise to it. And I certainly talk in the book about, you know, what some of the exercises that are most beneficial are, but it ultimately is not a necessity. And, you know, you can, you can get yourself metabolically healthy without exercising. And in your book, you talk about metabolic disease and what um, five markers to track for metabolic disease. When, can you define metabolic disease for us? Like, what does it really mean? And, um, you know, what are some of the uh, markers to make sure to check? Sure thing. And I think this is probably, you know, the most important concept that I tried to get through in the book is that you need to understand what metabolic health is in order to be able to improve it. So broadly, you know, metabolic health just means that your body is using the inputs that you are giving it, mostly in the form of food, and it's using those inputs properly. So it is 
turning that into energy to, you know, fuel all of your activities and, you know, all of your cellular activities. It is building and rebuilding your tissues as needed. Right. And it's supposed to store a little bit of that energy in case there are times when food isn't available. And unfortunately, you know, our modern food environment has hijacked that system. And most of us, 88%, as I said earlier, are no longer metabolically healthy. So now our bodies are largely storing too much energy and we never are able to tap into those energy stores. In order to measure metabolic health, like I said, you can't, it's not obesity. Um, you can't just say I'm not obese, so I'm metabolically healthy. You have to look at, you know, actual measurements of metabolic health. And there are five official measurements that I recommend every person knows. The first you can do at home. It's your waist circumference. Mm -hmm. You take a tape measure, you wrap it around your waist, just above your belly button. Best to measure it first thing in the morning. And if you're male, you want that to be under 40 inches. And if you're female, you want it to be under 35 inches. The next measurement is your blood pressure. Again, you can get a cuff and check it at home. You can go to the supermarket or the drugstore these days and get it checked, or you can go to your doctor's office. You want that to be less than 130 over 85, and that needs to be without medications. So mm -hmm. if you need medications to lower your blood pressure, if you've already been diagnosed with high blood pressure, that is a sign that you're not metabolically healthy. Then you have to look at a couple of blood markers. Fasting blood glucose, the amount of sugar in your blood when you haven't eaten for about eight to 12 hours, and you want that to be under 100. These are the United States units, milligrams per deciliter. Sure. And you want it to be, again, without medication. If you are diabetic, type two diabetic, again, you're already uh, not in good metabolic health. And then we look at your cholesterol numbers, but importantly, we don't look at the cholesterol number that most people focus on, the LDL, the bad, so-called bad cholesterol. For metabolic health, you want to look at your HDL cholesterol, which is you know, oftentimes called the good cholesterol. You want that to be higher, the higher the better. Uh, if you're a female, you want it to be over 50 milligrams per deciliter. If you're male, you want it to be over 40. Mm -hmm. And then the final number is your triglyceride level and you want that to be less than 150. And you look at all those, and if three of the five are not you know, within the healthy range, you have what we call metabolic syndrome. And that means that you are at high risk for developing things like diabetes, heart disease, many forms of cancer, Alzheimer's disease. All of these have been tied to poor metabolic health. If you have one or two of those abnormal, it's a warning sign because we know that people who have one or two abnormal today are very likely to progress and have three or more abnormal a few years from now. And as I said, only 12% of adults have all five numbers in the healthy range. And uh, we need to start changing that. Speaking of blood pressure, you mentioned that um, there's the highs. Uh, what about people that have significantly low blood pressure all the time? Is that yeah. a risk? Um, you know, that is not a necessary, that's not a risk for metabolic disease. It can be a problem for other reasons. Sure. Uh, and, you know, it's certainly something to look into for your physician. But typically, high blood pressure is the sign of poor metabolic disease. And interestingly, high blood pressure is oftentimes the first sign of poor metabolic disease. And it doesn't get recognized as such. Most patients who go to the doctor and their blood pressure is high, they simply get told it happens with age, it's normal, just take right. this medication and you'll be fine. And that's one of the many missed opportunities that you know we should be diagnosing that as a sign of poor metabolic health and trying to fix the underlying cause of that poor metabolic health, as opposed to just covering it up with medications. And these are all really good things. And you mentioned in your book that you have seven, um, I guess, principles for metabolic health. So to support these areas that you've just brought up, can you, can we talk a little bit about those seven principles? Sure thing. 
Um, I think the most important principle in there is to eat whole real food. Um, you know, we have a lot of discussions around diets and what to eat. And in the end, I think when you look at foods that support metabolic health, they are all whole real foods. So I tell people you should eat the things that grow in the ground and you should eat the things that eat the things that grow in the ground. Animals, vegetables, uh, you know, a little bit of fruit uh, is all metabolically healthy. And you should try and eat them in as close to the natural form as you can. So minimally processed. If it comes in a box or a bag, you should not be eating it. If it has more than three ingredients and those ingredients aren't each, you know, a whole real food that you can identify, you shouldn't be eating it. I know in your book, you talk about the different diets, but do you mm -hmm. think that there's a higher chance of success at metabolic health by following a more carnivorous diet or a more vegan diet? Do you, have you seen trends yeah, in your... I've seen success with, you know, both and everything yeah. in between. And as you mentioned in the book, I go through many of the popular diets, vegan, carnivore, you know, low carb, keto, Atkins, Mediterranean. And I talk about the features of them that are metabolically healthy and are not metabolically healthy. Oh, okay. And so there are many commonalities between them that I think are metabolically healthy and depending on personal preferences and, you know, what's available, what you like to eat. I think you can work within the framework of each to make them metabolically healthy. And the key point that I want people to understand is that metabolic health needs to be the outcome that we judge the success of the diet on. You know, if you are if you improve your metabolic health with a certain way of eating, or you are maintaining good metabolic health with a certain way of eating, then I have no problem with that way of eating, whatever it is. But if you're not, you need to consider that, you know, changes uh, should be made. Yeah. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, depending on your individual body and your health and the way that you're eating, a certain way of eating may not be the most beneficial if your blood markers and other labs are not doing better. And so that makes sense for you and your journey. How did your weight loss journey happen? And what did you, um, what diet did you follow? Yeah. So, you know, I went through an evolution where I started kind of just low carb, low sugar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I got introduced to you know, metabolic health uh, by uh, Gary Tobbs. Okay. And so I first started with eliminating sugar and that led me into low carb, um, you know, kind of what I would call keto and then ultimately carnivore. And that's what I maintain today. You know, I would say, I'm, you know, I, I would say I'm 95% carnivore, sure. you know, sort of animal based diet. And that has worked for me. I have now lost over a hundred pounds and maintained wow. that for five years. And, you know, I feel better today as a, you know, 47 year old than honestly I did as a 27 year old. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I look better, I feel better and my metabolic health numbers are better. You know, I was morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic and I have been able to overcome all that. You should talk with Dr. Cy Vest. I feel like you guys have very similar histories. I, yeah, I can... Rob, Rob and I have actually talked, <laughs> okay. um, you know, we, we're both in Florida and we, we've met up at a couple of the conferences. That's awesome. And yes, I, I think we, we have many similar stories. It's interesting, you know, when you look at the physicians who have, you know, really embraced uh, low carb and metabolic health, it's almost always because they first overcame they, their own problems, uh, you know, by doing so. And we, we see that it works. And we all get curious enough to yeah. ask, why isn't this what we're taught in medical school? You know, why didn't we learn this? And why did we have to discover it for ourselves? Why did I have, you know, why did I hear it from a, a scientific journalist, you know, Gary Tobbs? And, and you know, Gary is brilliant. Right. And I, I have learned much from him. But why was I learning this information from him and not from medical school or not, you know, reading about it in the medical journals? You know, you and Dr. Sivas and other practitioners a lot more because you've had your own journey, you have the empathy to understand your patients and when they struggle with food and when they struggle with diet. So it's a lot more comprehensive of care. And I think it just makes you guys good practitioners because you understand 
your patient, right? And the struggles that they actually go through rather than if you were healthy your whole life, it's hard to understand. You could just say, put down that you know, piece of pizza or put down whatever it is and just go work out more. And it becomes a lot harder to empathize. Going back to the seven principles, can we um, go into some of the, you know, the seven principles you'd mentioned for metabolic health? Sure. You know, one of the other uh, principles, uh, it, it's actually the first principle in the book, is that you need to think of your health as a system rather than a goal. So, you know, most people tend to focus on you know, kind of very specific goals. They want to lose 20 pounds. And when you do that, one of two things happens. Either you lose the 20 pounds and you say, great, I've reached my goal. I can kind of go back to what I was doing before. And over the long run, you know, you gain back the weight and more. Many people, myself included, have experienced that. Or you don't reach your goal. You don't lose the 20 pounds and you get you know, kind of down on yourself and you get depressed and you're like, what am I bothering for? I can't lose, you know, the 20 pounds and you end up back in a bad place. And instead, what I like people to do is, you know, look at your health as an overall system. Again, focus on metabolic health. And I am going to, you know, eat the foods and adopt the habits that support my metabolic health. And the weight loss ends up being sort of a side effect of that. Um, But I think it's a more Uh, It's a more sustainable attitude and it's a more positive attitude that, you know, I am doing these things to benefit myself rather than, you know, I'm going to just restrict what I eat until I lose the 20 pounds. I find that that uh, is not sustainable. Yeah. Uh, And I I think that makes a lot of sense. Go ahead. Yeah. And then I was going to say, you know, one of the other principles that sort of goes along with that is making you know, sustainable changes and kind of making them one at a time uh, rather than trying to change everything at once, which can be overwhelming. Right. And also, you know, brings up the problem of if you change too many things at once, you don't know what's working, and what's not <laughs> working. So I say make one sustainable change at a time. And that way you can really tell, you know, this helped or this didn't help and I need to try something different. Have you seen some people, um, if they just change little increments that, um, sometimes they, they take a step back in the other direction because, you know, it's like, oh, I only stopped eating bread. I guess this weekend it's okay that I don't eat bread. I mean, that I do eat some bread. Um, let's just go all in and just cut out all the carbs versus I'll just slowly reduce the carbs. Have you seen? Yeah, I think, I think that's very personal, you know, varies a lot. There are some people people who need that, you know, kind of, it's like quitting smoking, you know, some people will just go cold turkey and quit smoking and never pick up another cigarette. Other people need to sort of reduce, you know, one at a time. And so I think that's very independent. That's very, um, you know, personal. Uh, But, you know, what I mean by making that one change at a time is, you know, you can't go out and say, okay, I'm going to change everything that I eat and I'm going to, you know, run a marathon tomorrow (laughs) and I'm going to get better sleep and I'm going to eliminate all the stress in my life. You know, you, I I like people to kind of focus on one area at a time and then, yeah, within the sort of food, you know, overall concept, um, you know, you just, you start to make those changes and you judge the response to each change individually, as opposed to, you know, trying to change everything at once. And then you're not sure what's working and what's not working. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's really good. There's um, people that I work with that will try to change everything, right? So they try to change the diet, the lifestyle, then they add the working out, then they add the fasting. And then all of that, they maybe do pull too many levers at once. And then all of a sudden they're not doing as well. So let's say they have hypothyroid symptoms because they're under eating and fasting and working out and then they're just not feeling well. And so I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, Sometimes we try to hit perfection and then that level of perfection makes us have more failure days than even having days of perfection. So it's almost like that 80, 20 rule. It's better to do like 80% of the days well than try to hit perfection. Exactly. There's one other tip that you brought up is um, sleep, getting really good sleep, and you have tips to that. I know in the low carb space, there are some people that sleep better. I know I am one of them for sure, but there's other people that say that they sleep worse. So um, they wake up 
I think it's a cortisol response in the night, but they wake up at a certain time or sometimes they just wake up and they can't go back to sleep. And some people say in general, they feel really well on a low carb keto carnivore diet, but their sleep is just really bad unless they add some carbs. Do you have any tips about that? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, this is another one of my principles uh, is that I say get enough sleep. You know, I don't say get eight hours of sleep or nine hours of sleep or seven hours of sleep. I say get enough sleep. And as you mentioned, as, as you experienced and I've experienced the same, you know, it's not about the quantity of sleep necessarily. It's also about the quality of your sleep. So I end up sleeping less these days that I'm metabolically healthy, but I'm more rested when I wake up in the morning. I get better quality sleep. And, you know, other tips, tricks, you know, of getting a good sleep environment and not having, you know, the TV on while you're trying to sleep and, and not staring at screens, you know, too, too closely, you know, before you're going to go to sleep. Uh, you know, not drinking alcohol right before you go to sleep. These are all things that help with sleep quality. Uh, but the principle that I want people to understand in terms of metabolic health is that you need to get enough quality sleep. And that might be six hours, it might be eight hours, uh, it might be 10 hours at the beginning that, you know, because you're not getting good quality sleep, you need right. more quantity sleep. Uh, but ultimately, you need to find um, what allows you to feel rested when you wake up in the morning and get through your day without, you know, feeling tired. So you have a, another point of, you know, finding a doctor that really gets it right. Yeah. Um, but it's one of the biggest questions I always get is, do you know a doctor or practitioner in my city? And I don't know that many in all of the different locations in the U S right. and then outside of the country. Do you know a resource where people can find doctors and I know there's several websites, but I mean, do you know of any that, you know, people can find doctors that are more like-minded? Yeah, the one that I, I think has come together most recently that I oftentimes point people to is the Society of Metabolic Health mm -hmm. Practitioners. Um, they have a directory. Um, and then it's also a matter of, you know, more and more you can find doctors online. And right. I'll make the shameless plug that, you know, Ovadia Heart Health is my telemedicine practice. I work with people all over the country. The, the concepts that I talk about in the book are, you know, how to ask the questions of your doctor to kind of figure out, you know, if they're the right doctor for you. And understand that, you know, not all doctors are, you know, as knowledgeable about metabolic health as, you know, myself and many of the other experts are. And that may be okay, you know, as long as they're not actively working against you, which is something <laughs> that I know, you know, you and I run into a lot where, you know, we hear about the patients, we have the patients who, you know, they start on this metabolic health journey and they're losing weight and they're off their diabetes medications and they're off their blood pressure medications. And, you know, they go to the doctor and they're all excited. And the doctor just looks at their LDL cholesterol number that has gone up. And they said, oh, this diet is horrible for you. It's killing you. And they won't even consider that, you know, overall the patient has improved their metabolic health. So, you know, you attitudes like that from physicians. I think mm -hmm. if your physician is closed minded, is not curious enough to ask these questions like, you know, how did this patient get off of diabetes medications, which I've never seen happen before? You know, if your physician won't ask, you know, isn't open to that information, then I think ultimately that's not going to be a good physician for you. And thankfully, more and more physicians are, you know, learning about metabolic health, are open to metabolic health. Um, you know, our, our network continues to grow. I go to the low carb medical meetings and, you know, more and more there, there, there are more and more physicians there in all sorts of different specialties. So it is becoming easier, uh, but it can be a challenge sometimes. In your telemedicine practice, do you also read labs then? Um, do you, can you pull labs for people and then read labs in terms of like a low carb? I mean, like the LDL, for example, for you. Yeah in context, it makes sense that it can go high as long as the triglycerides are going down and HDL going up, that type of thing. Yeah. I mean, my background as a heart surgeon that obviously, you know, I, I sort of have a focus on heart okay. health. I attract patients, you know, around heart health. I often get those 
those sort of, you know, patients that, you know, have cholesterol issues that they're sure. concerned about. Um, but, you know, in general, I deal with all aspects of metabolic health. And yes, I, I you know, I work very closely with my patients via telemedicine and we do, you know, frequent laboratory assessments. Okay. We look at, you know, those blood markers that I mentioned are the minimum or the starting point of, you know, assessing metabolic health. But, you know, I typically go much deeper uh, with my patients on metabolic health assessments. And then is it for all 50 states? Um, so I am able to see patients in all 50 states. Okay. Uh, there are some restrictions in certain states that okay. I might not be able to, you know, order the labs directly or, you know, prescribe a medication. Um, but, you know, I can see patients from all 50 states okay. and I do see patients. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a huge thing because um, last time I think I had Dr. Brett share and he only saw mm -hmm. patients in certain states. And so it's good. It's good that yeah. you. One of, one of the, uh, I would say benefits of, you know, everything that's happened around COVID is it has made <laughs> telemedicine, you know, more commonplace it's good. and better accepted. Uh, so, um, and, and I, I, fortunately, because I am based in Florida, Florida has, you know, fairly uh, permissive telemedicine rules, and that allows me to see patients from anywhere. That's awesome. I'm, I live in Texas, so I think rules are pretty similar. So that's good. Um, anything else you want to share about your book? Um, you know, is this for everyone? Is this for people that are before getting sick? Obviously, we touched upon those. But what if you're already sick? Is it like the diet? Should they follow those? I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so it's never too late to improve your metabolic health, you know, even if you've developed heart disease or, you know, type two diabetes, um, you know, improving your metabolic health can always improve your overall condition. You might not be able to undo all of the damage that's been done, um, but I have, I, I can tell you, I have never seen someone get metabolically healthy and worse in their overall condition. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, if you're too far along in the process, you know, metabolic health might not be able to improve everything, right. but it will improve some things and it's never too late to start. Uh, but the earlier, you know, you start, the better, the more that we can prevent these problems, the better. Again, you know, the book is called Stay Off My Operating Table. And that really is my mission to help people stay off my operating table. Because no matter how good a heart surgeon I might be, and, you know, no matter how good all the other heart surgeons that are out there are, you're always better not needing that surgery in the first place than, you know, having the surgery, even if it's successful. My husband's friend had heart surgery and he wasn't even 40. Um, I don't think they had any um, family history or anything, but why do you mm -hmm. think people are getting heart disease earlier? Is it because of the things you just mentioned? Yeah, it's clearly because of our, you know, declining metabolic <laughs> health in this country. And, and, and unfortunately that is common. You know, I am now operating on people in their thirties and forties oh fairly gosh. routinely. And, you know, realize that I, you know, I trained as a heart surgeon. I went through medical school, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. And at that time, it was very unusual to, you know, be doing heart surgery, uh, you know, for, and, and we're talking about, you know, atherosclerotic heart disease right. here. We're not talking about congenital problems. Um, but, you know, it was very unusual to do those types of operations on 30s and 40 year olds when I started my career only 20 years ago. And now it is commonplace. And the cholesterol, you know, so again, I, I talk about this in the book, you know, we focus on cholesterol, we think cholesterol is the cause of heart disease. The cholesterol, you know, issue hasn't changed any, we've, we've had better and better <laughs> cholesterol medications now over all this over this past 20 years. And yet the problem of heart disease continues to worsen. So cholesterol is not the cause of heart right. disease. I want people to understand that cholesterol plays a part in the development of heart disease but it is metabolic health that is the first and foremost, you know, cause of heart disease. And we need to focus on metabolic health if we're going to make a meaningful impact on that. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, where can people find your book and where, like, how can people work with you through the telemedicine aspect? And then where can people find you? 
Sure. So the book, again, it's called Stay Off My Operating Table. It's uh, on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, all the major online booksellers. It's available for pre-sale now. Its release date is November 11th. Uh, so, you know, uh, probably shortly after this podcast gets released, it's going to be audiobook, Kindle, and uh, print uh, formats. My uh, website is ovadiahearthealth.com, O-V-A-D-I-A, hearthealth.com. That's where you can go find out about my practice. Uh, You can schedule a call with me to determine if joining my practice is the right thing for you. And on social media, I'm on uh, Twitter, at iFixHearts uh, is where I'm most active. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And I'll put it all in the show notes. You know, I skimmed through your book and it's really helpful and there's a lot of information in there. So I highly recommend everyone to check it out. And again, I'll put it in the show notes. Thank you so much for, you know, coming on my channel and just sharing your wisdom with my community. Thank you, Judy. It's been great. Okay, guys. I think the clear thing to take away from this discussion is that, like he said, just 20 years ago, it was unheard of to really work on people that were in their thirties and forties for heart surgery. And now he is doing more surgeries for people in their thirties. It's time that we take back our health and changing our nutrition is such a big component of that. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed the interview. Dr. Ovedia's book is available at all the retail stores that he mentioned. I will also put it in the show notes. Make sure to check it out because it's an easy step-by-step process to understand how to support your metabolic health. And if you want a more vegan diet over a carnivore, I don't recommend it. But if you do, he also has the steps for that and why there are pros and cons for every single diet. It's pretty interesting. So make sure to check it out. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys later. Take care. Bye, guys.